Yeah, what would you do if you received a prophecy from your leader in the LDS church? So I'm acting as if you were still an active participant, but if you received a revelation that said, we have two years to become one, the Lord's given us two years to become one, what would that do to that body of people? <laughs> Put them into a frenzy. You mm -hmm. would just kind of, you would, you would stop um, paying attention to everything else in your life. You just focus on that one thing, thinking That's, it's gonna happen. This exactly. world has got to be a universal test. So what is it that affects all mankind? What is the true test? And it's not getting a piercing. It's not getting a tattoo. What is it that people are being tested on? And I think it's this. I think we are all being tested. How do we treat our fellow men? Are we humble and meek? And do we give and do we treat them as we want to be treated, which is Christ's way? Or do we oppress? Do we oppress our children? Do we oppress our wife? As soon as we get a little bit of authority in a church or in a community, do we start to lord that over people? I wonder if sometimes we're not oppressed by our favorite Christian ministers who yep. are oppressing in the name of righteousness or light bringers, light bringers that they, that their way is the best way when in essence you're prohibiting people from yep. from really knowing Jesus I, in a spiritual sense being you know living in this bubble mm -hmm. um, fake reality where, yeah it, it, it's reality to us it is reality to us uh, our religion our culture the ordinances how to get to heaven what jesus expects all of this becomes reality and it's this little culture in a nice neat uh, bubble of religion or whatever and then all of a sudden you see through that there's a crack or a chink in the armor right a light bulb falls or you read something you're like that doesn't add up with scripture i've read before and all of a sudden once you start looking, it's like the matrix. Everything kind of falls down and you want to see truth as it is. You want to know God's truth and not yeah. man's truth. Yeah. Welcome back to Restore Gospel Podcast. I'm Mike Barrett here with Matt from Mormon Rescue. And we are friends having casual conversation about the things of eternity. We welcome you into that conversation today. I've been excited since coming across Matt's channel and him appearing on Restore Gospel Podcast. Now it's kind of as a regular. Um, I've watched his videos and I wanted to do a deeper dive into those videos where we can discuss some of the things he's presenting. And maybe I can uh, represent maybe the audience listening and ask Matt some questions and we can get in a little deeper. Maybe we'll cover some of those things that others are are questioning when they're listening to him, Matt. Uh, you get really, you're getting seems like your channel has gotten a lot of views uh, recently and you've you've gone from what you say uh, you know wow if 10 people see this amazing to uh, a lot of people what I like is the expressions of gratitude in the comments and seeing how many other people are coming to the same realizations as the Holy Spirit's working on all of us so say hi Matt welcome thank you yeah it's nice to be here again with you Mike this is a treat to be able to talk it's one thing to sit down and spend hours agonizing over how to say something just the way I want to and get the logic right to be able to just have a free and open conversation. This is relaxing. So yeah. So this is just a little side project. I was interested in this. I didn't bring the other guys into it. We're still planning on recording as a group tomorrow. So uh, that's not replacing anything. But this is just a personal uh, idea I had and Matt was game for it. So I'm excited. We've got his most recent video queued up. And I said, why don't we just start with the one that you just released? Because interesting enough, the day you released that, I had spent about six hours watching YouTube videos on the subject of the spirit world and um, from a biblical scholar, mm -hmm. what the scriptures actually say about Satan and the angels and the heavenly host and demons and the spirit world. And these are part of the scriptures, but it's something that sometimes we shy away from. I've either seen two extremes. We want to ignore that these things are there because they're <laughs> too hard to talk about or they're just mysterious mm -hmm. or other people i think take this idea of the spirit world and make an idol out of it and we get into all kinds of demonic possessions and spiritual deliverance and i think there's a place for this but uh, i've also seen it go where it just becomes the main focus of everything right and our focus is always repent become like Jesus, learn to love one another like him. 
Yeah. So we want to keep that in mind and go through this video. So I'm going to shut up and I'm going to hit play and we're going to just pause this at different uh, places. So uh, let me share my screen here. Who is Lucifer? All my life, I was taught in the LDS church that Lucifer is Satan, the devil. It's taught in church, in conference, in modern LDS scripture, and especially in the temple endowment. As LDS.org says, Lucifer fell in the premortal existence, and after his fall, he became Satan and the devil. So that's pretty clear cut. Lucifer equals Satan. And yet the last time I read Second Nephi, I wondered, is this really talking about Satan? Or is there something more here? And the more I thought about it, the more I researched, I've come to believe that Lucifer is not a specific person, like Satan, but instead is a type and a pattern of person that occurs over and over in this world. All right. Something I realized <clears throat> after I made this video is that several people, I wasn't very clear. It's, I definitely believe Satan is real. Satan is the devil. The point of this video is not that Satan isn't real. The point of the video is that Lucifer is not necessarily, is not specifically Satan. So I hope to clear that up. Satan no. is definitely real. The devil's a real person. But Lucifer, I think, is something different. Okay, so that's the point. And did you like that image I had from the temple <clears throat> endowment, the Elias Temple endowment of the guy? With the horns? Oh, no, 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 no. The one right after that, the guy who was smiling um okay see that is iconic everybody who was in the temple in like the 90s and the 2000s knows that point because he turns to the camera and he's and he talks to the to the people out in the audience he breaks the fourth wall and he says you're going to be in my power or whatever like something like that and uh anybody who's been in the temple just knows you know that creepy moment in the temple endowment and they tie that to lucifer so, okay yeah, it was cool that someone had taken a picture of it so I could share it. So I believe this topic's uh, relative to both RLDS and LDS. However, uh, I got to admit, you guys, have, you guys have a few more layers you know, of, the level I, of Lucifer. Right, right. I've never been in a temple where Lucifer was talking to me as part of a sacred ordinance. And I'm not, I'm not making fun of these things. As a matter of fact, I'm very humbled to know that, um, that, the impact that this ceremony and the endowment and these uh, things in the temple have on LDS members. And so looking at these things is, I want to do it respectfully, not making fun or anything, but it's a reality that, you know, these things have a great hold over the membership. So was this, you said this was your reason for, well, this is part of your reason for asking this probably as you're reading yeah. the book. Oh, yeah. And I don't make fun of it either. I smile and I'm happy because I realize how deep I was in. We were so true blue. We would go to the temple and watch these videos and every single word, you know, someone said it takes a lifetime to understand the endowment and I'm halfway in my life and I didn't understand any of it. And it was like serious stuff. And so I look back on it now that it's been about a year or two <clears throat> since I've been through the endowment and I just have to think, thank God I'm not there anymore. Mm. You know, he says that we have to put on these aprons in the temple, Satan does, and so everybody dutifully puts on their aprons, and we wear them throughout the temple. We wear these little satanic aprons, and he says to do these things or else we're going to be in his power, and so we all do them. And uh, it's really amazing the hold that the LDS Lucifer has over people in the temple. But mm. anyway, so I'm not talking. I'm happy to be out. One other, uh, I just want to make a comment. It's good to keep in mind that words and language are only as valuable as the meanings behind them. And so as we discuss Lucifer, we have to realize that in, in Christianity and in uh, the history, in our scriptures, these words have taken on different meanings than I think they were originally um supposed to have or or they've added additional meanings and i'll just throw a monkey wrench in there uh, for instance what i've understood and learned through different scholars of the bible project and videos is that even satan so we use the word satan as the devil or we might use the word lucifer as the devil and this devil is also you know perhaps the serpent in the garden who came and tempted adam and eve mm -hmm. uh and 
the reality is, is that that word Satan is not an individual, but it was a Hebrew word to describe an opposition or an adversary or uh, an opposing point of view. And it even could be used as a, as a good thing, as if there was something that uh, maybe was off and someone's giving you a contrary uh, way of looking at things or a contrary viewpoint, that that would be adverse to what you are believing. And that is the word, the Satan. It's actually the Satan. It's not Satan as in Matt or Mike or sorry to to use our names to compare, <laughs> compare to this. But we think of it as this evil devil with horns, right? And I think just to keep in mind as we use these words, these words have changed meaning and have taken on different meanings through time. And so we may not even be discussing the same thing, but I just want to say that all of these things originally weren't maybe perhaps the way we understand them today. And so that's what I hope to bring out and watch in your video. That's a great point, Mike. <clears throat> in fact, I spend so much time as I read the Book of Mormon just looking up words, looking up the definitions and etymologies of words and see how they've changed. And my goodness, how many words have changed and how much that warps maybe our perception of what Christ was really trying to say. And uh, some of it I think probably is accidental, but some of it I think is purposeful. Mm -hmm. so, Satan is the next one on my docket, I guess. That sounds like a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the other thing is, as, as you hear these words, I don't want us to, I want us to have a as good of a, picture of you know our walk with the lord our spiritual walk our physical walk mm -hmm. as we can uh, and not get caught into false uh understandings such as you know i don't know if you've ever heard but i've heard people share testimonies of you know the devil was just trying to get me down today because i had <laughs> you know something good to do to god and you know my car got hit on the way to work i lost my keys and all these things happen and then there's a blessing at the end and i'm not trying to belittle that at all but i want to know you know is there you know when i do bad is it because of my old sinful fleshly fleshly carnal desire or is there the spirit entity behind me all the time saying mike choose this choose this and there's this constant <laughs> battle and i'm you know if i'm not praying enough i'll get sucked into this side and you know all of these things i think are floating around out there in the room as we discuss these things as to why it's even important yeah but i'm curious so Mm -hmm. All right, stop me, Matt. I'm gonna. It's gonna re, be rewinded okay. in okay. here. As LDS.org says, Lucifer fell in the premortal existence, and after his fall, he became Satan and the devil. So that's pretty clear cut. Lucifer equals Satan. Okay, I'm gonna. And right there, you've mentioned before the LDS scripture search, right? Yeah. Uh, so you said, and sometimes it's not that easy to. Um, it's not that easy to get what you're wanting to search for. Right. In other words, so this, you know, you're searching for Lucifer, and this is the book of Moses, it looks like. Um, Moses 4, 1 through 4, of course, there's section 76. So these are writings outside of the Book of Mormon when you get right. this point that after his fall, he became Satan and the devil. Yeah. Now, what the Book of Mormon says is Lucifer fell in pre-mortal existence. We've got Isaiah, Luke, and Second Nephi. Um, I don't know. Do you quote these scriptures later on in the yep. video? Okay. All right. I'm just going to hit play there. And after his fall, he became Satan and the devil. So that's pretty clear cut. Lucifer equals Satan. And yet the last time I read Second Nephi, I wondered, is this really talking about Satan? Or is there something more here? And the more I thought about it, the more I researched, I've come to believe that Lucifer is not a specific person, like Satan, but instead is a type and a pattern of person that occurs over and over in this world. The word Lucifer, I was surprised to learn, only occurs once in the entire Book of Mormon, in a quote Nephi includes from Isaiah. This fact reminds me of the words of Jesus to the Lehites when he appeared to them in through Nephi. He said, a commandment I give unto you, that ye search Isaiah diligently, for great are the words of Isaiah. For surely he spake as touching all things concerning my people, which are of the house of Israel. Therefore it must needs be that he must speak also to the Gentiles, that's us. And all things that he spake have been and shall be, even according to the words which he spake. It's fascinating that Jesus gives a command here to search the words of Isaiah, not just to the house of Israel, but also to us, the Gentiles. Why would he want us to search the words of Isaiah? I think it's because of that last line, that 
all things that he spake, all things have been and shall be. In other words, I believe Isaiah doesn't speak about lone events or individual people, but instead all of his words have to do with repeating types and patterns, patterns of things that both have been and shall be. And so in this way, I believe that the Lucifer in Isaiah's writing is a pattern. I was curious to look at the etymology of the word right, Lucifer. Let's pause there. This time reading through, just, you know, I get an idea of something that I want to learn more about, and then I research it to make it into a video. And I hadn't noticed that phrase, all things have been and shall be. And, you know, I thought, well, some parts of Isaiah, but to think all of it is, that's really, that's really something. And now that I'm getting into Isaiah, the Isaiah part of the Book of Mormon again, in my personal study, I'm looking for that. I'm looking for everything in there has been and shall be. It's all a pattern. So, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Do you relate that to the the word prophecy? We I think sometimes when we talk about prophets or prophecy, we think of uh, somebody fortune telling what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of us probably look to our even our patriarchal blessings like that to allow yeah. us to know what's going to happen in our lives. Yeah. But also, is not part of prophecy an understanding of things as they are um, and as they are to come and as they were and some wisdom and linking those things together. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's putting, I think part of prophecy is putting puzzles together or bringing ideas and scripture together to present them in a way we can understand. Um, not always just for foretelling future events, but, but revealing how things are. Is that part of prophecy in your understanding or have you ever thought of that? I haven't thought about it. It sounds sounds good. In other words, maybe the idea of prophet, mm -hmm. seer, revelator, maybe those words aren't three separate things, but maybe that's just one way of describing uh, how things work together, that there's there's notes of understanding what's to come, revealing truth in a deeper way or a clearer way to understand yeah. it, um, seeing those things that way. Yeah. And the interesting thing about Isaiah is not only is he a prophet saying this is going to happen, he took either God just gave it to him or he spent a lifetime taking these little nuggets of prophecy and putting them into almost poetry and into chiasmas and telling them in such a way that that's beautiful. It takes so much effort to do that. And uh, it, I think it's kind of cool that Maybe Isaiah had a lot of time on his hands, or maybe that was just his life's work or what. But yeah, he turned simple prophecies into, into beautiful works of, of, uh, of language. Let me ask you something that we talked about before, and that is, uh, you know, Nephi, I think it's Nephi, reveals early on in the Book of Mormon that his brothers were having a problem or a hard time understanding Isaiah because they didn't understand the culture or... They were removed from that. I'm terrible at paraphrasing scripture. <laughs> but then at the same time, we're told to study the words. Who is that? Who is this actually being talked to when when the scriptures, you know, when it says in the study the words of Isaiah? Is that to the Gentiles? Is that to believers? Is that to the house of Israel? You know, if, if they were having a hard time understanding it all the way back in Lehi's time, just because they were removed from the culture, how, what about us a thousand years later or so, you know? Yeah. And how do we how do we study those in a way that's beneficial to us? We're way off topic of Lucifer now. We are we're off topic. We have unlimited yeah. tape, I always say, in the digital world. Right. <laughs> well, I think the Book of Mormon is like just from the title page on, like Moroni's words, it makes it clear that it's for primarily for the house of Israel, but also for the Gentiles and for the Jews. And um when when Jesus talks about telling them to search the Isaac. Isaiah, he also says these will be of great worth to the Gentiles. And so I don't think that we're cut out of this just because we're not from the house of Israel. Um, and I think that it has just as much to do with us as it does with them. In fact, it mentions us quite a bit in Isaiah. And so I think it's there for us. But yeah, we don't have an understanding of what Jerusalem was like in the days of Isaiah or of Lehi. And so we're at a disadvantage. But like... I think that all of us can have an understanding through 
I guess what I would say is the, the true revelation, um, not the, the gimmick revelation that we're taught about so much in the church, but where God reveals understanding to us. To reveal is to uncover, to make somebody see it. And I have felt like throughout my entire life, Isaiah has been this part of the Book of Mormon, where you're like, oh man, I have to read this. And I've either either skipped it, which I usually do, just skip it. I'll just jump from, you know, 1 Nephi 12 to um, after 2 Nephi. Or I'll just skim through it and be like, this is all muck. I'm just doing it because I have to. And I've never really taken the time to try to learn Isaiah. And these last two years, well, it was actually right before I started having lots of questions. I would read Isaiah and I'd be like, there is something weird here that I have never been taught. And there is layers to this. And there's inter there's things that work together to tell a bigger story. What is this bigger story? And I feel like after since I've started being having an open mind and, and allowing myself to ask questions and praying, the Lord is helping me to understand so much more of Isaiah. And now I love to read it. I'm not saying I understand it all. That's not what I'm trying to say here. But it's becoming so much more clear and meaningful to me. And, you know, I like I told you the other day, there's that scripture that says they're ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. And I think that we can have Isaiah in front of us our whole lives and look at it forever and never understand it if we don't have the key, which is revelation, where the Lord reveals to us in our minds what it means. He gives us understanding. And, oh, uh, yeah. I'm so glad you brought that concept up because I probably don't speak to it enough, but I'm rare. I'm very aware of that concept. Just doing a podcast that, uh, that always coming, you know, always seeking and, but never coming to an understanding of the truth because we talk about, you know, casual conversation about the things of eternity. We talk about them all the time. Yeah. And my hope is that, you know, people are continually hearing these discussions and they're spending time on their own in the word and praying to the Lord. And I know sometimes we ask questions and we have ideas in our mind, the answers. And so I, sometimes I think people think they don't, you know, they're lost or they don't have opinions on these things or asking questions and they want to. And it's like we're doing it for the sake of discussion. But also I learn as you explain what the words shared with you and hopefully you do the same, you know, as we dialogue together. But yeah. uh, the goal is, is like not to just have endless discussions because it's fun, but to arrive at truth that brings me into deeper relation with Jesus that allows my heart to be more reflected and become a heart like his. I mean, that's always the goal. So it's good to point that out. I like how you, I like how you said that. Yeah. And also if mine and your conversations, my, what I've seen happening is like sometimes when we talk about something or somebody else on the internet talks about something it's not necessarily that we are taught or that we teach. It's that we spur other people, or I am spurred, to think about things. And as I think about them and pray about them, the Lord talks to me. Um, my friends that I meet with on Monday nights, uh, that's what I see happening when they get together or when they talk via, um, you know, on Messenger, is that they spur, we spur each other to do our own reading and our own thinking. And I hope that's what my channel can do. It's not that I have answers. It's that I have questions. And I hope that it, I don't know, encourages other people to also have their own questions and look to the Book of Mormon for their answers. Yes. Amen. And I know a lot of times these videos are a reflection of what, what you've learned up to this point. Mm -hmm. And maybe hours of discussion happen afterwards. And, and so you said it's nice to have an opportunity to even, you know, if your thoughts have changed since you know, doing the videos um, and that continued growth. So awesome. I just read an, a, such a cool quote yesterday and I'm going to butcher it, but it's something like humanity means or being human means we have permission to change our minds in five minutes. <laughs> 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 something like that. And the quote was better, but it's something like that. We are people who change and that's totally okay. It's totally okay. And yep. it's nice that we worship a God who does not. Yep. He gives us the freedom to grow to to try new things to change our minds because you're right he is the one who doesn't change all right let's continue on here talking about lucifer the morning star it means light bringer or carrier of light 
and, quote, was interpreted spiritually by Christians as a reference to Satan, even though it is literally a reference to the king of Babylon. So this notion that Lucifer is Satan is not only believed in by the LDS Church, but by many Christian denominations. Okay. And I disagree for a couple of reasons. Yeah. I had up. never been taught before that it's referring to the king of Babylon, and yet it's in the same chapter. It says it right there. Um, thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. How has the oppressor ceased, the golden sea ceased? No one in 49 years of life in the church has ever told me that. They've always just said Lucifer as though it was Satan. So what were your now, thoughts about that? This website here is not is just a, <clears throat> it's not a church website, right? No, no, it's just like a dictionary website. It's an etymology website. Yeah, that phrase, son of the morning, I don't know is, it's not a bad phrase, is it? Yeah. It's just what ba the king of Babylon called himself. He mm. called himself the son of the Mormon. He called himself, he he tried to teach the people, much as so many rulers throughout history and even today, try and teach them that they are called of God or they are, you know, a son of God or they are, they have God's authority. And it looked different. You know, the king of England said, I rule because God put me here. You know, the LDS prophet, I have God's authority, the only one that has authority on earth. The king of Babylon in his day was the biggest king in the world, probably. And he's like, I'm put here because of God, the pharaohs. I am divine. I'm not human. Every major ruler throughout history has tried to say that I am, you know, the son of the morning. I am um, uh, chosen by God in some way. And the king of Babylon. So a light, a bearer of truth. A yeah, love, a bearer of uh, truth. Uh, one worth worthy of being followed. One, there, Yes, there you go. One who has something that everybody else doesn't have. I've got light that you don't have. It says comparing to Venus in the morning sky. And, mm -hmm. you know, they were so much more in tune to the skies and things in the early because of the way they lived and because of uh, their, their cosmological view of heavens and stars and things were different. And so yeah. they're comparing. Now, I just I am going to take issue with that word Satan in quotes because they are also they're they're assuming that Lucifer and Satan are the same thing. Right. And and some of the what I've been reading and researching is that, as we talked about earlier, that idea of Satan even is not necessarily, quote, the devil. But words are only as good as their meaning. Right. So as long as we're understanding what we're talking about. Right. These, these references. OK. Anything else? Nope. First, I don't think Lucifer just means Satan because the scriptures never say it does. And so, to me, it seems like a human invention. The actual scriptures seem to say something very different. And second, I don't believe Lucifer just means Satan because the invention of this meaning seems calculated to confuse the real meaning in order to benefit the actual people who follow the Lucifer pattern. Church leaders throughout the centuries seem to have purposely confused the scriptures in such a way that allows them to emulate Lucifer, all while hiding in plain sight, pretending to be men of God. To illustrate okay, this, right there. his words about Lucifer in 2 Nephi 20. <clears throat> so that's something that really struck me. I had never realized before this week that Lucifer only occurs once in the Book of Mormon and once in the Bible. <sighs> Blows my mind. If Lucifer were Satan or the devil, it would have been a lot, <clears throat> would have been all over the place. Like if you look at how many times the word devil appears in the Book of Mormon or the word Satan appears, there are a lot. But the Lucifer is only once. That doesn't make sense. But anyway, the 412, also in Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? There it is. The only mention of the word Lucifer in both the Book of Mormon and in the Bible. And that's, you said, being a quote from Isaiah in the Book right. of Mormon. So yeah. basically... It's mentioned one time in recorded history and just repeated in the Book of Mormon. All right. Yeah. Okay. Simple enough. But now let's look at the, it in context of the chapter. As I read this chapter carefully, I begin to see the true pattern or type that Isaiah is describing with the title Lucifer. And I want to an analyze the Luciferian pattern in this chapter in three parts. First, the traits of a Lucifer. Second, the main mistakes a Lucifer makes. And third, the effects a Lucifer has on his fellow men. So part one, the traits of a Luciferian. Looking at this chapter, these words jump out at me. 
They are all titles or synonyms of titles for a Luciferian. They are oppressor, ruler, chief one, or king. And more words jump out at me, which are the symbols and accoutrements of these Luciferians, such as staff, scepter, pomp, gold, and throne. What a clear picture of the Luciferian type. Can you pause it right there, Mike? A king, mm -hmm. a chief, or a... Something else that makes me think that it's not, <clears throat> that Lucifer is not Satan, is the chronology. Look at the very first chapter, or very first verse up there in verse 3. It just got done talking about um, the day when the Lord will free the people, right? Mm -hmm. um, before it got to this part. And then in verse 3, it says that it shall come pass in that day, the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and thy fear. And it come to pass in that day, thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden sea ceased. So it's talking about a future day um, when the people who are freed will say, we've been freed from you. If Lucifer is Satan, then it wouldn't be talking about a future day because we believe that he fell pre-mortally. So why would it be talking about it as though it's in the future? So just another clue. If we're not going to say this until that day, until the future day, then it's got to be talking about somebody who will be brought down in the future, a king or a ruler who will be removed from power um, or not have power over us in the future. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I just haven't, I have not contemplated this before. So I'm contemplating it as you're talking, even though I've watched this twice. This mm -hmm. is why we're doing this. So um, it says in that day, right? Yeah. Shall come to pass in that day. So this Lucifer uh, was an actual person, but it could also be a pattern of action or a pattern yep. of existing to the devil is good at this game has been around a while and uses the same things over and over to enslave men and to take them away from Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you were talking about when Nephi's brothers were, were saying, what does this all mean? And, uh, and they're like, is this temporal or is this spiritual? And he says, it's both temporal and spiritual. It's going to happen spiritually, but this is also a temporal pattern. If you look at the king of Babylon, if you look at all the kings throughout history, um, history is full of, you know, there will be a vacuum and a ruler will be raised up. He'll oppress the people. He'll be torn down. And then, you know, a couple hundred years later, the same pattern repeats itself. The book of Ether is a great example of this. It just repeats itself over and over and over again. There's so many Lucifers in the book of Ether. And then they get torn down. And the people are freed again. And then another one pops up and same thing happens. And this is just a pattern of life. So, so, so this is kind of, okay, let's back up right here. And I'm, I apologize. I, unfortunately, our verses are different. Um, yeah. and so <laughs> I have a general knowledge when I see scriptures in RLDS, like where it's at kind of and what's going on. But uh -huh. Second Nephi 24, what it says, it shall come to pass in that day. Is there something prior to this, you know, that puts this? Yeah. In? Okay. What? Where it just didn't we... look. I just didn't think I had. So for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, yea, from far into the ends of the earth. And they shall return to their lands of promise. And the house of Israel shall possess them. And the land of the Lord shall be for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives unto whom they were captives, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And then it goes in, and it shall come to pass in that day, the Lord shall give them rest. Okay. Do you think we've seen that yet from the house of Israel that they've come to rest from their from their enemies? That they're that they've come to rest from their sorrows, from their fears, from their bondage. Do you think that's happened yet or is in the process of happening? Certainly, we have a major war over yeah. there or, or battle right now. I don't think it's happening right now. I don't think that's it. But it has happened in the past, like from this exact place that Isaiah was talking about. Um, when Lehi left Jerusalem shortly afterwards and the Mulekites, um, Jerusalem fell. And they were all taken captive by Babylon and carried off. But then um, historians aren't really sure, but maybe like between 20 and 50 years later, um, they were able to get come back to their lands right. and to be freed. And it's happened again and again. Um, the Book of Mormon, we'll see it happen as well. 
And so I think it's just a, a pattern that always happens. Right. We had the Holocaust, which was absolutely horrible, which did end, which was ended by the, you know, by the, um, by America, along with other countries, and they were yeah. freed from that. But what a terrible thing. You had the slaughter of millions of Native Americans, both in Central, South, uh, United States now, that were um, just pilfered as explorers came to this continent and massacred. I think Corey's show that, is that uh, the deaths down in Central, South America, um, by the explorers that came over, you exceed even the Holocaust that we're aware of as far as numbers dying. Right. And so, um, so it is like, I guess that's back to a, a pattern of Isaiah, things as they were and as they are to come, or, or as we talked earlier. Yeah. But this is talking about the whole earth is at rest. And so I see what you're saying here is like, this is a pattern for us to look forward to in the future as well as something that happened in the past. And it can be even on a micro level. It can be in a home where a parent or a spouse is very oppressive or is um, domineering, mm -hmm. and and then the the children or the or the spouse is finally able to get away and or find some way to reduce that person's power, and they finally find peace. Um, or in a church where someone is oppressive over you. And you feel like there's nothing you can do. And then somehow you're able to find some freedom, escape from that bondage and find peace. Or um, even a government, you know, um, people that I know who have immigrated here um, have able, been able to escape um, a situation that was impossible for them. And uh, yeah, it's just it's just a, the thing about I think about this so often. This has got to be a universal test. This world has got to be a universal test. So what is it that affects all mankind? What is the true test? And it's not getting a piercing. It's not getting a tattoo. What is it that people are being tested on? And I think it's this. I think we are all being tested. How do we treat our fellow men? Are we humble and meek? And do we give? And do we treat them as we want to be treated, which is Christ's way? Or... Do we oppress? Do we oppress our children? Do we oppress our wife? As soon as we get a little bit of authority in a church or in a community, do we start to lord that over people? And as I study ancient history and even modern history, it's just one big cycle. Every single time someone gets an authority, it goes to their head and they become oppressive. Um, unless you believe in utopia. Um, may have existed, may not have, or the lost seat of Atlantis. But other than those times, and besides Third Nephi, and maybe right after Christ came, there's been hardly any times in the history of mankind when people weren't oppressed, when somebody got into authority and power over them. And I think that is the great test of whether or not we're going to be in the kingdom of God, is whether we are oppressive or not. That's interesting. I think that oppression, sometimes uh, you think of that as being you know, kind of vulgar, in your face, harsh, you know, angry. But I wonder if sometimes we're not oppressed by our favorite Christian ministers who yep. are oppressing in the name of righteousness or light bringers, light bringers that they, that their way is the best way when, in essence, you're prohibiting people from. Yep. From really knowing Jesus. No, there's just certain feelings and activities in the restoration as a whole, certain leadership that's followed. And it's always about, you know, recently numbers and let's get as many people together as we can and let's go here and have these things and listen to this revelation. And it's really in a not so subtle way, but also mm -hmm. a subtle way, hurt, hurtling people towards this idea still that we're waiting for our god-given appointed leaders to receive direct words from heaven so that we can know what to do mm -hmm. and that not necessarily bad or god can't work that way but he's told about so many other promises we have that maybe we could be focusing on yeah you know but you can be oppressed in a way i think that's not so obvious that's that's great okay ruler who oppresses with his staff or scepter while sitting on his throne, surrounded by gold and pomp. Obviously, few people ever achieved the literal embodiment of this description, 
But how many men and women seek after the metaphorical power of a Lucifer? How many people try to gain power, money, or status, and then use those to enrich themselves and control others? I've never had a throne or a scepter or been a chief, but I am painfully reminded of the experience when, years ago, in an LDS temple, I was anointed with oil to become, quote, a king and priest, to, quote, rule and reign in the house of Israel forever. And so I can't escape the reality that I have participated directly in mimicking and hoping to become a Lucifer. I just keep coming back in my thoughts to this movie, The, the Truman Show. It's such a, such a prescient movie. And to think of The Truman Show that I was living in as, a, as an LDS person, that it, it's, um, Christoph says, we accept the reality with which we are presented. And to grow up as an LDS person, I just accepted the reality without thinking about it. When they said, you need to go to the temple today to get your washing and anointing, I'm like, okay, what is that? Show up, they take, make you strip stark naked, and they put this little shield over your front and back, but the sides are open. And then they come in with water and then oil and touch different parts of your body, and it's really uncomfortable. Like they're getting in your private places with oil, and then they put oil on your head, and they anoint you to be a king and a ruler. And it just is like, right, right then I was like, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. Everybody does this. But looking back, I'm like, holy cow. Who does that? I mean, that is just so bizarre. When you you refer to the Truman Show a few times on here, yeah. and just talk a little bit about that in you know thirty seconds, what that premise was of that show. Okay, the Truman Show. Truman, he's born into the show, and he doesn't know it. And all this, his known world that he sees is all fake, and they're all actors, and he's the only one that's not the actor, and they're trying to make him think that it's all real and that this is normal life. And then one day he starts to see that there's something wrong. He sees a light bulb fall from the ceiling where it's supposed to be sky. And he hears something on the radio that isn't quite right. And he's like, wait a minute, this may not all be real. And pretty soon he, he finds out that it's not real. And then he's able to escape, um, to escape this little world. And man, if that doesn't talk about the LDS world to a T, I don't know what does. Right. So we're, in a spiritual sense, being, you know, living in this bubble. Mm -hmm. um, Fake reality. Forever. Yeah, it, it, it's reality to us. It is reality to us. Uh, our religion, our culture, the ordinances, how to get to heaven, what Jesus expects, all of this becomes reality. And it's this little culture in a nice, neat uh, bubble of religion or whatever. And then all of a sudden you see through that there's a crack or a chink in the armor, right? A light bulb falls or you read something and you're like, that doesn't add up with scripture I've read before. And all of a sudden, once you start looking, it's like the matrix. Everything kind of falls down and you want to see truth as it is. You want to know God's truth and not yeah. man's truth. Yeah. So I just wanted people to think about that for a little bit when you reference the Truman Show. I got to take that one step further. There's a part in the Truman Show where a guy tries to like, sneak his way into the Truman Show and say, hey, Truman, it's all a lie. And then the, the bouncers quickly just grab him and whisk him off and he disappears. And then and they're like, oh, that, that never happened. That never was. And it's so perfect because, okay, so just yesterday, someone came on my channel and they left a, a nice little comment on one of my videos saying, you should just leave. You know, if you, you, know, you, you can leave the church, but you can't leave it alone. Why don't you just leave it? And it made me think that's exactly how they keep the Trumans still in the show is anytime anybody sees the cracks, they quickly whisk them off. They immediately excommunicate them or disfellowship them. And they make them part of disfellowshipment, um, which I found out is that you cannot talk, pray, answer questions, raise your hand, anything in church. You can't speak. And so that's how they control the narrative is as soon as they see somebody starting to realize what's going on, they say, they discipline them and say, you cannot talk or anything. And so they whisk off anybody who might tell the truth. And so they keep the people who are still in the Truman Show in the show. And that's what this person on my channel was trying to get me to do. He's like, hey, just be quiet. Just leave. You can't talk. Anyway. That's, uh, we were having a discussion online uh, about scripture, trying to just talk about scripture. I, yeah, I, I remember one of those little bombs that someone jumps on there and like, 
you're the subterfuge of the restoration. And then they walk <laughs> away, no more dialogue. It's like, right. Kim, okay, yeah. So there's that spirit of just go away, just uh -huh. stop, just shut yeah. up, go far away. Let's not dialogue. They don't want to address the issue. They just want you to be quiet. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly. exactly how my leaders were with me. Be quiet. If you take your stuff down and be quiet, we don't care what you believe. You can keep on as a member. You just can't say anything. But if you say stuff, then we have to get you out of here because you're disrupting the other Trumans. Yeah. That's, it's an interesting concept. When lifelong friends ask other friends, why are you hanging out with him? He doesn't even believe in the, in the gospel anymore. That's, mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Fear mongering. All right. Let's, let's head on here. Just one. Okay, part two. The second part of the Luciferian pattern has to do with the main mistakes a Lucifer makes. And I think they're found in verses 13 through 14. It says, For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This reminds me of the description of the Tower of Babel in Helaman 6. It says, and Satan put it into the hearts of the people to build a tower sufficiently high that they might get to heaven. Okay, pause it real quick. Isaiah's words here show. Okay, I'm going to make a prediction that someday we're going to find out the Tower of Babel was not an actual structure that was trying to reach the clouds. In It was more like a structure that you go into to get to heaven. Because history repeats itself. People are the same as they used to be. We make the same mistakes. Satan is the same. His patterns are the same. And today in our church, come into this tower, pay the right amount of money. You can come into this tower and you can get to heaven. That's exactly what the Tower of Babel was. Come into this tower so you can get to heaven. Okay. That's so this this idea, I think, started early on in uh, Kirtland, Ohio. Uh, you, and you can read in church history, uh, whether you want to call it a temple or not, it had a purpose of a temple. And that was, in church history, you read uh, Joseph Smith talking to the council in Kirtland and saying that basically our our level of knowledge is where it's at. And, and if an angel would come even and try to teach us more, we couldn't understand it because we're darkened. Hmm. And we have to have a place built where we can go and perform an ordinance that will then give us understanding, will give us power to understand. And, and he's talking about the washing of feet, that it would cleanse them from that generation's blood, that there would be this endowment of understanding, and then they could be taken to the next level. So you see this pattern, and I've, I've got all that referenced, uh, and I've had it on here before, and we'll, we'll bring that up again in a specific episode, I hope. But that's in our LDS church history. You see that pattern even there, that you have a, a special place you have to go in order to, so to speak, get to heaven or to understand things of heaven or of eternity, and that you can't have that until that place is built, until you're able to go in and be chosen to go in and perform this thing. And I know that that jumped from that quite a ways forward in Nauvoo, that we're now we're way up in, you know, now we're way off the rails, but it just takes a little bit of a untruth or a little bit of a incorrect idea that Joseph presented in Kirtland, Ohio, that now we have, um, you know, LDS temple rites and ordinances. Now I don't believe Joseph designed all those in any way, but man, he presented the idea that there has to be buildings. There has to be certain people performing certain things in those buildings and you have to go to that building, go through that ordinance in order for you to understand more about heaven. That is, I think, absolutely took place in the early church. And that's what opens the doors to maybe now we see this, this idea of this Luciferian idea of light and how it comes to us. Yeah. Whether or not Joseph was intentional or not, people just fall into the same patterns throughout history. We all do this yeah. over and over again. I'm yeah. not convinced anywhere... I can never say that Joseph had evil intent. I, yeah. I want to assume Joseph had good intent. Joseph had incredible experience with the Lord and the translation of the Book of Mormon process. I want to say that, you know, he always was on, he had good intentions regardless mm -hmm. of what happened. 
maybe that makes me feel more comfortable. But I'm not here to debate that. I'm just, I just think there's a direct connection, right, to some of those things that happen. I think so. That's really good. I'm glad you brought that up. All right. And we're still quoting out of the Book of Mormon, right? In the same right. section, what, 20, 24, I think, 24. chapter 24 of the LDS. Okay. Me, that a Lucifer is someone who is not content with being under God and equal with everybody else. A Lucifer seeks three things. Oh, I'm sorry, man. That what you just said there, not content to be under God, but wants to be above other people. Um, I think that's more subtle in our culture and certainly not across the board, but it does seem to be much more ingrained in the LDS side. Yes. Yeah. That we will be gods. Yeah. Yep. Oh, there's, there's no doubt in my mind. There's, there's ministers today in the restoration that are looked up to that are leaders that are asked to speak at any gatherings, you know, that in those hearts, there are those desires or those ideas to not want to be above God, you know, or not want to be under God, even though not to be admitted. But in the actions, I see that, that, that they want the power. They want to continually remind us that they are the ones you go through to receive all spiritual blessings and to receive those blessings from God. It's interesting where it says, thou hast said in thy heart, and it may not even be in their heads. And mm. It may not be something they've said verbally, but in their heart, they know they want to be a God or like God. Not Maybe not even above him, but just they want to be at the same height as God and above other people. And my goodness, is that prevalent in the church? Then I mean, there's a whole pageantry around different ranks of seatings. And even the 12 apostles, there is a... When they get up and go out of a meeting, they have to go out in order of seniority. I mean, who does that? That is so bizarre. Who says, oh, you can't go in front of me because I'm above you in rank? That's so weird. Or you have to sit in the right positions. Or, you know, when someone enters the room, everybody else has to stand up. I mean, it's all, it's in every single part of alias culture. Have you seen, I don't know, I don't think that this is in other temples. I may be wrong, but in the Kirtland Temple, it's definitely unique. You've seen the main worship hall with the with the hierarchy of the podiums and how Joseph and Oliver could be on the highest level and go behind the curtain and receive revelation from God and then come out from behind the curtain and dispel that information to the people. Uh, you should so put a I, picture of that. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll see what shows up in the final. Yeah. <laughs> but that's right. So that idea of, I like what you said. It may be in the heart, but maybe not the mind. And yeah. isn't that isn't that dangerous? Mm -hmm. You know, when you think, you know, if you have a leak in your house or, you know, you put some caulking in or whatever, but the problem is it's it's a hole in the roof. And so you try to cosmetically fix something, maybe your brain, but the thing is the foundation, your heart is there and that, that has to be rooted out. And I, I, we all struggle with pride and, and wanting to be, you know, Satan always wants us to yep. feel like we need glory. And so continually giving that back to the Lord and wanting his will, not mine, is difficult. Yeah. But we're it's learning. universal. Yeah. I see this pattern in here that you're showing. First, to be exalted. He says, I will exalt my throne. To exalt literally means to grow high or tall. In other words, to be elevated, especially in rank or honor. Does that sound familiar? The goal of exaltation pretty much sums up the whole goal of my membership in the LDS Church. Contrast that to what Isaiah says elsewhere in 2 Nephi 12. And it shall come to pass that the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Can the question of exaltation be answered any clearer than that? A Lucifer also seeks to, quote, sit upon the mount, which is an elevated place, of the congregation or an assembly of people in the sides of the north. Does that sound familiar? Look up at the stand next time you're in a church or government meeting to see the Luciferian pattern in action. Funnily enough, it occurred to me that in the massive, great and spacious LDS conference center, the hierarchy all sits on the north side. Is that just a coincidence? Or were the hierarchy intentionally trying to fulfill Isaiah when they built their thrones there? I don't know. We talk for a second. Right. Lucifers to what Jesus himself said of the Pharisees. So, I mean, obviously it's in the church. There's no doubt about it. And even in government, it is obvious. <clears throat> but even in like the workplace, 
So a couple years ago during COVID, we got a new principal in the, sc the school I was teaching at. And before that, we would have staff meetings every, like every Tuesday morning for half an hour, 45 minutes. And it's a chance for us all to connect and to talk about things and, you know, what's important right now, what's troubling us. Well, the new principal comes in and she says, I'm making a new rule. No one can talk except for me during the staff meetings or somebody that I appoint to come up and talk. And if you have something to say, put it on a sticky note and leave it in this box by my office. And so immediately she shuts down, you know, 50 teachers, you can't say a word, and she's the only one that can talk. And so it was that way until, until um, for a couple of years until I left teaching there. This trait is everywhere. It's in church, it's in government, it's in business, and it's even in the home. Um, and so it's just something that once you see it, you see it everywhere. Let me bring that video back up. I think I played it last time without showing it. Here we go. He said they, quote, love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Wow. And greetings in the markets and to be called of men, a rabbi, a rabbi, elder, president. And Jesus said, woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. How can our leaders read the words of Jesus and not feel the irony of their actions? All right. Finally, a Lucifer is someone who seeks to, quote, be like the most high. This cuts close to my heart because it was what I was taught to seek my whole life in the LDS church, to someday become a God just like the most high. As God is, man will become. Instead of being content to be in his kingdom and sing his praises forever. It's scary how this phrase has been in the scriptures all this time, and yet I was taught to seek to be a Luciferian by the very church that professes to believe in the scriptures. Wow. Part three. Okay, now I want to look at the third part of the Luciferian pattern in Isaiah, the effects a Lucifer has on his fellow men. Looking at this chapter, these words jump out at me. Sorrow, fear, weakness, oppression, bondage, and servitude. I'm starting to see why Jesus wants us so badly to study Isaiah. These words are so powerful. Look at what a Lucifer causes. Someone who seeks to be exalted, to sit on the stand, to have power and riches and pomp. Someone who wants to be a chief and a king to rule and govern over others. This is what they cause. I think of the times that I and others I love have been made to feel fearful, sad, weak, in bondage or servitude and oppressed by those who we believe are our leaders or our chiefs or our rulers. The image this creates in my mind is one so clear. How has it taken me my whole life to recognize these power-hungry people for who they are? They are Luciferians. Luciferians. Isaiah has taught me in this chapter what the root of all evil is and who the wicked of the world truly are. They're not the people who drink coffee or walk too many steps on Sunday or get an extra piercing. The wicked are not those who aren't able to pay their tithing to their leaders or who don't get to wear their garments every minute of every day. The wicked are not those who won't sustain their leaders or swear oaths to cut themselves. The true wicked... Mike, I was watching... Those who exalt... Do you know the book Machiavelli? I know the oh, book, yeah. By Machiavelli, yes. Um, let me see, what is it called? I have the book, but I haven't read it for a while. The what Prince, I think it's called? Yeah. Anyway... Um, he addresses in that book, the theme of his book is that it's much better to govern out of fear than out of love. Because love is transactional, but fear is one way. And so if you can make people be afraid of something, then they are much more um, likely to be in servitude to you than someone who, who is obeying out of love. And so that is the great, um, the great goal of a Luciferian ruler or any kind of person who's a Luciferian is to get people to fear them. Um, wow. This is so poignant. So in other words, you know, I've always wondered about all of these warning prophecies we always have that don't come true. So in other words, if we can convince you the Lord has spoken and something happens is going to happen in two years, we need to meet together and you need to follow us and you need to, you know, throw in the, Throw in with us, and we need to get our numbers up. Boy, how coercive, huh? If you can yeah. convince someone that there's – that's interesting. So if you fear something, you're more likely to be trotted along and you know with the crowd and follow. Yeah. 
global cooling during the 1970s, global warming, the world was supposed to end by 1912 or by 2012. Um, you know, we get people to be afraid and when they're afraid, they do stuff they normally wouldn't do. And the, the pinnacle of that is the LDS endowment where you're supposed to go in there and mimic cutting your throat and pulling out your heart, ripping out your guts. If you, you know, if you, if you give away any of these things, these secrets in the temple and, uh, yeah, how much more fearful, how much more governing by fear can there be than that? Yeah. What would you do if you received a prophecy from your leader in the LDS church? So I'm acting as if you were still an active participant, but if, you received a revelation that said, we have two years to become one. The Lord's given us two years to become one. What would that do to that body of people? <laughs> Put them into a frenzy. You mm -hmm. would just kind of, you would, you would stop um, paying attention to everything else in your life. You just focus on that one thing. thinking That's, it's going to happen. That happened in our group. A couple really? of years. We're, we're, I don't know, maybe a year and a half out from the deadline, which will be around maybe the election, which... Yeah, anything bad could happen then. But my like point is, is that it causes a it causes a frenzy, but it can also cause people to maybe obey or strive to do things outside of what the scriptures say. And really, that whole thing it, it's it, it motivates people to work together and try to come together and worship. But you know, it's like to me, it's always if the heart hasn't changed, you just have a form of godliness, but you deny the power. And if we're changing because we're afraid or because someone we respect gave a revelation from God, let's get motivated. I'm not saying that, you know, strict warnings from God are not motivating factors, but there can also be a pattern used when those are used incorrectly um, or under the semblance of light when it's really just the spirit of man. And, and what have we done other than taking another detour? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't know you guys were under that. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, we've had a few through the years. We've we've been told countries were going to invade. We had five years to get ready. Um, ah, the weird thing is, is that when things don't happen, where's the accountability? Where's the backup? Where's the, <laughs> you know, we, we have short memories and we just look for the next revelation, I guess. In the LDS world, we would say that was just a policy. <laughs> <laughs> okay themselves, who lift themselves up, who oppress others, either on a macro scale as leaders of this poor guy has an unfortunate expression. I've seen that caption, <laughs> that little face. He looks so grumpy. And I'm sure that's not his normal disposition, but the Salt Lake Tribune just had a poll where they um, pulled LDS people who their favorite prophets were of all time. And he didn't even crack the top. I mean, he was nowhere in the top. Oh, or President Nelson. Yeah, usually it's the guy who's usually it's Joseph Smith and the current prophet, but he was not even close. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're at an hour. So let me know if there's a place to that you would like to stop. We got 13 minutes left of your video, Churches but I'm governments or on a micro scale as individuals who seek to rule and oppress within families, within communities, within congregations, or even within friendships. And so I have to check myself every day. Am I seeking to rule? Am I oppressive to my wife or to my children? Am I lifting myself up in public or in private? Am I causing fear or sorrow to anyone? And when I analyze times I've been a loser for my life, I seek comfort and repentance and hope that through Christ I can be forgiven and changed and blessed with charity, the greatest gift of all. Mormon taught in Moroni 7, Charity suffereth long and is kind, and envieth not, and is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, and rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. So charity is the opposite of the desires of the Luciferians. Charity envieth not. Luciferians envy money and power and recognition and titles. Charity is not puffed up. Luciferians desire to be exalted, literally, to grow high or to puff themselves up above others. Charity seeketh not her own, but Luciferians are all about seeking their own, their own power, their goal, their exaltation, their rule over others. And charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, which is the valuing of one person over another. Luciferians' heart and core is iniquity, the placing of themselves above others, both in life and in eternity. 
I want to put my trust in Christ and not in the many Lucifers that dominate the world today. Isaiah gives me hope that someday the Lord will bring down these Lucifers and free us from oppression. Isaiah says, In that day the Lord shall give thee rest, and the whole world is at rest and is quiet, and they break forth into singing and rejoice. Because, in verse 32 it says, The Lord hath founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it. I can't wait for that. I'm so grateful for the Book of Mormon and the teachings of Isaiah found in it and the Bible. I'm grateful for Christ's encouragement to study these words. In contrast to earthly Lucifers, I believe that Christ is and always will be the only true king. As he taught us to pray, quote, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I have complete trust in his kingship because he is the only king who is the opposite of everything we know about kings. He doesn't seek to rule or oppress as we understand those words. He doesn't seek a throne or gold as we understand them. Instead of oppressing us, he governs through hum humility and charity. Instead of lifting himself up, he descended below all things to lift us up, to forgive us and to liberate us. Instead of placing us in bondage, his yoke is an easy yoke and his burden is light. It is actually true freedom. So that was, uh, you said that you, you used the phrase earthly Lucifers. Uh, so let me summarize what I heard and you tell me where I'm wrong. You're looking at taking the idea that there's this Lucifer, but that it's a repeating pattern and it's almost a spirit or a way of acting in the church. Um, tie that in with Isaiah that, you said things as they were and as they are to come. Did I did I ref reflect that correctly? Yeah. So, yeah, summarize your – how would you summarize this 15-minute this video? What would you say to people today? How is it relevant? I think that this is the great sin. <clears throat> it's the opposite to charity, which is the greatest gift of God, and the one thing we have to have to make it to heaven. There's an opposition in all things. Charity – is being humble and meek, loving others, long-suffering, not seeking your own, not puffing yourself up. Luciferians are the opposite. They seek their own. They puff themselves up. It's all about them. So that is the great sin, I think. It is the people who are not going to be in heaven because those would disrupt heaven. Somebody who's drinking coffee in the corner of heaven is not disrupting anything. Somebody who's trying to oppress people is disrupting heaven. And I think that's the what would keep us out of heaven is if we if we develop those kinds of attributes and become those kinds of people. And uh, Luciferian is a religion. It's a church. I I watched a. a is it video. really? The Luciferians. Uh, Jacob Isbell did an interview with a. Uh, I believe they're part of the LDS Church or XLDS, but at one time was taken into a Luciferian church and they talk about their temple rituals. They talk about the temples that they have um, being set apart uh, for greater light and a lot of connections, a lot of connections. And so people, I think sometimes when we talk about conspiracy theories that maybe we think there's this underlying thread that weaves all through and everything's connected. And I think it's more like what you said that, there's a spirit out there and Satan kind of works the same over time. And so he stirs people up to do the same sins and to fall prey to the same sins in mm -hmm. our lives. And so that's how things I think resemble each other. Um, you know, did, does the current situation with temples and the restoration, did that come from some dark behind closed doors, satanic thing that we're going to turn this into a Luciferian church or did Satan just, does Satan just appeal or the adversary just appeal to the hearts of men that want to have pride and be lifted up? And that, and then from there on, it's easy to bring people into the same type of fallen yeah. state, right? I've heard those. I've seen like, you know, videos on, on the, you know, what they secretly do in the temple when everybody's not there is they get out the, you know, statue of Satan and worship him. Ah, that's a straw man. You do, Satan doesn't need us to do that. All he has to do is have us worship ourselves. That's he doesn't. We don't have to worship Satan openly 
to be satanic. We just have to worship ourselves. Mm. What do you think about? Um, well, so what my point was, so like, yeah, there are, there are Luciferian. It's a religion, you know. There are temples, I believe, Luciferians practice in. Sure. But those are very. So that would be to me very out in the open, very in your face, a front. We're not. And yet I, I'm concerned over those that appear as angels of light or servants to the people or shepherds of the flock yeah. who in their heart of hearts are just addicted to pride and maybe even feeling a sense of authority and power and deliverer of or intermediary, even being an intermediary to God to uh, experience greater light and greater spiritual blessings. Yeah. When, when in reality, you, you know, you're still seeking pride to yourself, even though in word you say it's all about Jesus and God, but what are the actions? What's the underlying spirit there? In fourth Nephi, the people that brought down the civilization, the golden age of the righteousness weren't, you know, from the outside, it was from the inside and they were the churches. There was the church that professed not to believe in Christ, but they were still a church. They believed in the law of Moses. And then there was a church that believed in Christ and but didn't follow, didn't practice what he taught. The churches themselves, or in other words, people who profess to have the truth are much more dangerous than people who are like, oh, we're gonna go over here and work a ship Satan, or you know, we're gonna go over here and, and drink beer or whatever. It's the people that profess to have the truth but corrupt it for power and gain. That's mm -hmm. so much more dangerous, infinitely more dangerous. Yeah, we saw that in the New Testament church, didn't we? When Jesus came on the scene. Yes. Um, the the religious rulers were they want peace. They're, they they want to they want to have peace, but yet it was okay if we murder and kill this guy for the sake of peace. Uh our righteousness is made by how well we follow the commandments and and the law of Moses. And this guy's telling us showing us that those things are fulfilled and Exactly. It's not yeah. the it wasn't the Roman soldiers who murdered Jesus. It was the, the, the church leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was stealing their light. He was stealing their place in society. Their power. Yeah. Huh, good stuff. All right. Well, All right. I won't drag this out too long. We can pick this up uh, if there's any follow-up. But uh, this was fun, man. This is, yeah. this is what, you know, Mormon Rescue is the YouTube channel. I'll have a link to the entire video there. Uh, but just talking about some of these things, I think is a different format and yeah, man, get the spiritual things going in all of our minds. So thank you, Matt, for coming on and doing this. Definitely. Thanks, Mike. Right. We'll see you next time. Yep.